as Michael and Alicia disassemble themselves at uh, the bittersweet responsibility of introducing the final, uh, the final program uh, falls to me. Um, and so without further ado, I will introduce you to Brian Bishop, who is Vice President for Digital Transformation at DeGreuter and who will speak to us on disruption and innovation lessons from the outside world. Hello, everybody. Hi, uh, I'm Brian. Nice to, uh, nice to see you all. Um, it's always wonderful to, uh, to have the very last speaking slot of any conference where the tension is at its highest and enthusiasm is strong. Everyone's raring to go. I'm, I'm uh, uh, super excited to be here. Thank, thank you, Mark, for having me. Uh, my talk today is going to be a little bit uh, uh, different. It's mainly about the perspective of switching industries after being in scientific publishing for a number of years. Uh, seeing some of the other business challenges that other industries face, uh, and then seeing what lessons you know can be learned from them. And I would also love to make it uh, highly interactive. So I appreciate all of your uh, questions. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to ask, uh, uh, it can be added into the chat. I'll keep the chat window open. Uh, and uh, hopefully this will be about 30, 35 minutes or so with uh, uh, some time for questions at the end. Uh, okay, assuming everybody can hear me fine, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I've got a, a camera view that does indicate that you can see my presentation, yes? All right, we're just going to assume that's a yes. Okay, so I guess the first question you, you might be asking is, who is this guy? And why should I be listening to him? Um, the only reason is because there is some uh, disparity in my uh, career path, which has uh, given me a perhaps unique perspective uh, to try and understand the world of scientific publishing and how it relates with some of the other industries that are out there. Or how is it different from some of the other uh, uh, things that are happening in the world where um, startups are being you know, formed at a rapid rate, technology improvements are leading to lots of new opportunities, and there's a lot of industry shakeup, uh, the only constant you know, being, being change. Uh, I started my uh, career in publishing at a uh, self-publishing company called Ex Libris. And I always have to mention in an audience of industry professionals, no, not that Ex Libris. It's a digital self-publishing startup from Philadelphia who was attempting to uh, democratize publishing by offering everybody uh, print-on-demand books that they could you know, have listed uh, and carried through traditional uh, book-selling channels like Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, I then joined Kluwer Academic, which then merged with Springer. Uh, I held a number of positions at Springer, including uh, Director of Innovation, or uh, Digital Product Innovation, which was a, a tough job, uh, and uh, VP of Platform, where uh, we built the team that built the, uh, the current version of Springer Link. Uh, I then joined the consultancy that, that helped us build Springer Link, ThoughtWorks, uh, went to go join the Navy, see the world. Uh, I uh, met somebody through that engagement who uh, I then worked for uh, at Just Eat, so the food delivery uh, organization. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's, uh, you know, there'll be a case study in just a second. Uh, and then from Just Eat, I moved into the travel industry at the Secret Escapes, which was, you know, in hindsight, not the best timing, uh, thanks to coronavirus. But, you know, we, we, we do the best we can. So I'd like to present a couple of case studies. Uh, and then just some of the lessons learned from that. And hopefully we'll have uh, enough fodder for some conversation and some questions uh, at the end of that. So the first kind of business environment that I ever worked in at Ex Libris, it was a, a startup. I was employee number two. Uh, we grew to about 120 uh, people. And the, the main business challenge we were facing was how can we use technology to make publishing a book affordable for everyone? Um, you know, there was a lot of um, discussion about whether or not it, that's a that's a, a lofty goal, whether or not that that should be an ambition that everybody who wants to make a book can make a book. Um, uh, and, and different, you know, different people that we spoke with in the industry had different perspectives on it, for sure. 
But what we saw was that new technologies were allowing people to uh, get published without having to invest thousands of dollars uh, in making, you know, a limited print run with some expensive typesetting and, you know, and uh, uh, cover design uh, that they would then have to store in their garage, you know, or sell out of the out of the trunk of their car. So with the advent of print on demand technology, uh, the kind of the, the ability to eliminate all of that uh, uh, cost out of the equation, you know, came about. And with, you know, desktop publishing and digital typesetting, um, it was possible and outsourcing, it was possible for us to produce those books at a very cheap rate. So those are the technologies that kind of enabled enabled us to do what we did, right? Desktop publishing and outsourcing. Uh, at first, we used um, cheap recent college graduates uh, in the United States, uh, and then of course that eventually got ended up getting outsourced to uh, uh, providers in the Philippines. Uh, it could have just as easily been India or any number of you know uh, places where the labor costs would have you know created such a compelling advantage. Uh, but combine that with print on demand. And there still wasn't enough to make a product. The key missing ingredient there was in order for people to buy a service from us to help them you know, become a published author, they needed to feel like their book was just as available and, and accessible as anybody else's book. So they needed to know that they could go and tell people, yeah, go to your bookstore, you know, go to your local bookstore and they can order, they can order the book for you. Uh, so it was really the online uh, retail and the ability to sell through those traditional channels that made that particular product attractive for that particular customer audience. The last piece of the technology puzzle is not only having a book and you know getting that price point brought down so you can you can make it affordable for you know almost everybody, um, but also the ability to connect that book to its audience. So digital marketing and the growth of digital marketing was really another enabling technology behind this. So Ex Libris, you know, produce over 90,000 books. If you go to their website and do a search, you know, that's how many books they have. They've uh, advertised that they've uh, published from over 60,000 authors. Not a bad repeat rate then, you know, one in two, one in two authors are, are publishing multiple books. <coughs> and the impact that they had on the industry was in some ways gigantic. Uh, at the moment, 30 to 40% of ebook sales in the US are coming from self-published authors. Uh, now that itself has been, you know, enabled by uh, large uh, uh, book retail platforms like uh, Amazon's uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, or Scribd, or Lulu. Uh, but what it also did was it created a, another secondary market for support services for all of these newly newly published authors, like, for example, writing classes, or copy editing, or cover design, um, helping with, you know, getting your, your book to be listed, you know, uh, prominently on Amazon and Amazon implementation services. And finally, uh, digital marketing to, to help you, you know, find the audience for your book, which, you know, if you're not a digital marketing expert, you don't really have uh, a, a, the knowledge to be successful at. But in terms of greater industry impact, we didn't put Random House out of business. I mean, they were an investor in Ex Libris. Um, as far as we know, not a single publisher was harmed in the uh, uh, in the growth of the uh, self-publishing uh, uh, industry. Um, I, I say that the industry itself was kind of stagnant in terms of overall revenues, and uh, self-publishing was one of the highest growing sectors of that. So definitely the traditional you know, um, uh, publishing organizations lost some market share. So they may have been slightly harmed, you know, by the the creation of this new, you know, adjacent uh, publishing sector, but it wasn't enough to kind of disrupt the entire industry out of existence. And another interesting, you know, um, side note about this digital disruption was that there was a number of people doing what Ex Libris did. As a matter of fact, Ex Libris got bought by one of its competitors, iUniverse. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a number of people who will, you know, provide um, publishing service, you know, for you if you're willing to pay for it. But there are only a few large scale platforms that really offer uh, a very compelling, you know, overall proposition, uh, Amazon and, and Scribd being, being two of them. And I think one of the lessons from this is that um, there is a strong value add from the being the platform, you know, both from the you know aggregating the customers together, but also aggregating all the all the material together and, and providing all of those ancillary services. Um, there does become a point where the critical mass behind that is so compelling that other alternatives really uh, can't scale very much. You know, there might be a niche for selling, you know, particular, you know, uh, publishing services in a particular way. 
um, but it, you're not going to compete at scale with, with companies like Amazon. So the second case study that I, I wanted to uh, bring to the table was uh, Just Eat. <coughs> Apologies, I'm, I'm still got the remnants of coronavirus from a month ago uh, getting out of my system. Apologies for the, for the hacking. Um, and the business challenge that we faced at Just Eat was how do we respond to Uber Eats and Deliveroo? Now, the, the difference in the business model between these two is that Just Eat was a traditional middleman, a marketplace, a two-sided marketplace between restaurants who provided their own delivery services and hungry customers who wanted to uh, not give their credit card information over the phone to a stranger. Uh, so Just Eat had a very advantageous uh, position in terms of profitability because they didn't really need to provide that much um, service that, was, that had a lot of overhead, that was very costly. <coughs> On the other hand, companies like Uber Eats and Deliveroo had a large overhead in terms of hiring and or, or paying you know uh, onboarding a number of drivers uh and and getting that that tricky balance between the supply of, of drivers in an area and the demand for their particular service in an area so it was definitely a much harder you know operational uh task for them to uh, accomplish but uh and and the way that the traditional incumbents uh, so just eat and takeaway.com hung, uh, not hungry house um Grubhub in the United States, the way they initially, you know, faced these uh, uh, these competitors was to say, "Yeah, that's probably not going to work. Too expensive. It'll implode." But Deliveroo raised 1.7 billion dollars worth of investment, and I think that you disregard that at your peril, and eventually, uh, I'm sorry, Brian. Can I interrupt you for a moment? Your slides are not advancing. We, we're currently seeing the slide that has the header industry impact. Okay. Uh, how about now? Yep, good. This should, this should have a picture of two different um, uh, icons, sets of icons. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's the picture of their of the two business models, right? Just Eat, who's just a, a middleman, and Deliveroo, who's offering a lot of, of uh, service, but that service is very costly to create and maintain. <coughs> the thing that um, kept Deliveroo and, and Uber Eats from truly uh, requiring a response from the incumbents for a long time was the fact that because they had such high costs, where they attacked the market was at the high end. So they went to restaurants who weren't doing delivery at all, uh, and they tried to find the you know, most expensive ones that would people would likely order from. Uh, and they tried to bring those people into their, into their marketplace. And so for a while, there was no direct impact on you know, revenues for you know, a traditional incumbent. But then of course, what would happen is kind of the reverse of a Clayton Christensen disruptive innovation, where you you know start at the lowest end and then attack attack the higher the higher demanding segments. They did that in reverse, and they said, "Oh, okay, well, you know, we've got the platform now. We've got all this uh, marketing that we're spending. Might as well put restaurants that do their own delivery on our service uh, as well." And at that point, um, stuff got real uh, for the for the uh, the traditional incumbents in this space, and things that had previously been experiments now started to have tens of millions of dollars thrown behind them to, uh, to make sure that they were, they were able to compete. So what was done in this space? You know, how, how did the incumbents respond or specifically just eat? Okay, can someone give me a thumbs up that the slide's changing? Okay, so they did, <laughs> thank you. They did three different things simultaneously. They experimented with different ways of offering a delivery service. So one way was to just find lots of people who would do delivery for you and then try to um, effectively manage um, uh, multiple relationships with multiple delivery partners to get a large enough coverage area to provide a, a decent enough you know, service. And food delivery is, is unique in the sense that you can't schedule it in a four-hour window. Right? It has very, very specific and tight you know, uh, time constraints, otherwise it, you know, it's not, it's worthless. So there was one track we followed, which was let's use partners. Just see if we can 
integrate them well enough and then monitor their performance to make sure that they're delivering on time uh, and have the correct you know um, incentives in place in the contracts to make sure that we'll we'll get a high enough service level that we can do you know hot food delivery. Uh, the second option was, well, you know, do it ourselves. Let's completely start, you know, our, our own uh, organization that, that does it with employed uh, drivers. There was also um, a focus at Just Eat on the European markets, and there was a lot more um, uh, issues with the uh, the traditional Deliveroo gig economy, you know, uh, uh, model for employing drivers, that there was significant enough uh, concern that uh, um, having our own FTEs, our own full-time employees, our own staff, uh, might be might be the most prudent long-term you know approach to take with that. And then the third thing that that deliver sorry that Just Eat uh, did was that they took a sub subsidy that they had purchased in Canada, which had been grown from the start as a Deliveroo clone. So they had a series of technologies that they put in place at restaurants with customers and also with um, uh, with drivers to try and uh, create enough uh, su supply you know, for, of, of drivers to then you know, launch in a particular market and, and provide the service at a, at a high enough level. So th the question there was, can we take an approach that was completely built to be its own integrated thing, break it off so that we don't have to use, we don't have to change everybody's app. We're not going to ask everybody to completely change their, their app that they've been using to order food from us from, but then connect it to their, to their technology on the back end to then deliver all those orders. So in all of those three uh, experiments, they were completely technology driven, right? The first one was about, can we integrate with partners, which is all, you know, API integration, and can we monitor them to ensure the, the, the service levels are what we need them to be? So it's a lot of data infrastructure to uh, understand, uh, are we capturing all the data points we need and analyzing them? You know, are they staying within the boundaries? And you know, are we putting in place all the automated mechanisms if you know something happens immediately and you know capacity drops? Like, what do we do at that exact moment? Uh, for the creation of our own delivery company, we then needed to create get all the software that a delivery organization needs, like managing shifts of, of drivers and you know how do we uh, dispatch them? How do we take an order and then say? Okay, what's the what's the best person who can take this order from this place to this place? You know, at at this time within a you know ten minute window, and then of course <clears throat> we had to integrate that back into our our existing um, restaurant technology that we were offering, and with the subsidiary you know expansion, uh, we had to use their technology in the restaurants, but we had to cut off the the, the front end of theirs and say, okay, you're not taking your own orders, you're taking orders from us, and the result. <clears throat> Checking, I'm checking. You should see a graph now. Uh, the result was that as of the 2020 annual statement, which is the last one that I could uh, get my hands on, uh, there was 27% of all Just Eat orders being done via the, their delivery service. Now you may ask, which one of those experiments you know, won the day? Which model did they end up going with? And the answer is all of them. They simultaneously continued to expand their uh, Canadians, you know, subsidiary technology, built a large-scale uh, driver-owned driver, -owned driver um, uh, uh, operation called Scuba, uh, and they also continue to work with with outsourced partners in some in some markets. So the answer is they do it all. It, it just different approaches in different markets. So the last case study that I'd like to share with you is uh, Secret Escapes. And Secret Escapes' uh, business challenge was they were a very high growth um, startup in the travel space, and they wanted to continue that high growth so that they could sell themselves for lots and lots of money. But um, it becomes much more difficult once you, you know, get around the 100 million you know, pound in revenue per year mark to, to keep growing your revenues at 50 or even 20 you know, percent uh, per year. Uh, so the main, you know, the main business that they were in was negotiating unique deals with uh, hotels, specifically high-end you know, uh, hotels, that they could then advertise on a flash sales basis uh, to, to customers to say, there's a limited availability, you can have this deal, but you have to buy it within the next you know, two to four weeks. Uh, and and it, you can't get this, this deal anywhere else. So there's an incentive you know, for people to come to the, the, the Secret Escape site. Uh, and, and what they did was they scaled that business 
from having, I think the first time they offered it, there was about 15 deals on, on the site. So there was only 15 deals you could, you could browse through. And I think when I left, there was over 500 deals uh, available at any given at any given time. So they scaled that just up, you know, dramatically. But there was only a, there was a limit as to how fast they could keep, you know, getting more more customers, you know, in the door to to have these deals. So their challenge was, what do we do that will help us keep this growth rate at such a high level? And their answer was a little bit of everything. <laughs> there were a, a number of product experiments that were run. So should we get into a different kind of a deal, a long-lived deal, you know, that has doesn't have as big of a discount, it's not as uh, attractive, but it's very, very customizable. So it's like an itinerary and you can change the hotels you want, the, the things that you're going to do in the itinerary. So it's a larger, you know, basket, you know, value of what we're selling. Uh, it's got customizability as its main USP, and it's always always available. Uh, or should we get into offering flight and hotel packages together? Because most of the time when people are booking a hotel somewhere, they also need to get there, and that's usually a plane. So uh, the company experimented first with uh, using third-party packages and just basically renting somebody else's flight and hotel packaging capability. When that was proven to be very successful, they then said, okay, great. That seems like a, a worthy investment. We should build our own uh, hotel and flight packaging, you know, operation. What does that require? They had to get bonded, you know. They had to get the appropriate insurance, which took a long time, you know, to to come through. It's a significant amount of revenue that you're you're insuring against, uh, and they had to get all the necessary, you know, uh, legal uh, um, compliances in in the uh, markets that they wanted to operate in. But you know, those are all things that could eventually, you know, get get through. And eventually, Secret Escapes was making its own packages. It was also selling third-party packages, so it had to try to optimize, you know, the mix to say sell ours if we have it, if not, sell somebody else's. They also uh, said, okay, we've got so many deals now, and we've never really changed the the model for how people interact with our site. Why don't we spend some time doing some product development on our core kind of uh, offering and see if we can improve the ability to match a customer, you know, with a deal now that we've got so many deals. Also, why don't we try vouchers? Maybe that'll work. Along with that, on the on the back end side, there was a large a number of large technology, you know, uh, um, uh, projects that needed to be done. Some of which were simply uh, back-end things that no customer would ever see a difference in. Uh, for example, overhauling our data model, the way that we stored the information about the products in the database um, was very limiting and stopped us from being able to um, share the allocations that we had available across all of our markets. So it created a huge burden for us to allocate these things. And then if the allocation wasn't right, you know, we would we would always be losing, you know, somewhat because you could never predict predict it uh, accurately. So overhauling the data model allowed us to share the inventory, you know, amongst all the, the, the countries. And, you know, everybody then got to show 100 rooms to sell instead of, you know, you have 20, you have 10, you have 10, you have 30. We also rebuilt the front end to make it faster, built an iOS native app uh, under the idea that, you know, maybe a native experience would get people to purchase, purchase more, which it did. Uh, and of course, uh, building a data a data pipeline and a data warehouse to store all of the information so that we could do all the predictive modeling for what are the deals that we want to acquire in the future based on what it is that people are searching for, what people are looking for, what people are buying, et cetera. So those are all the, the things that they did. <coughs> and I'd love to tell you how it ended up, but I don't have the information. <laughs> they, are, they are not bankrupt though, so it must have worked, must have worked to some degree. So what, what were my main takeaways from this uh, uh, sojourn, you know, outside of this, the STM publishing world? Uh, well, the first one was that when faced with big challenges, you must make big actions. <laughs> and big actions, you know, are difficult, time consuming, energy consuming, capital intensive, and they often require uh, the building of capabilities that didn't exist before, hiring of, of people with expertise and specialized knowledge, and also uh, working the, the collaboration uh, between departments that you know may not historically have ever really needed to collaborate in that in that way. So, for example, at Just Eat, when offering a delivery service, it wasn't just a 
uh, a thing that, that we needed to integrate on the restaurant side of things so that the restaurant knew that a driver was coming and you know when when would they arrive and see them on the map but also changing the customer experience so the customer knew what to expect and that where we did have delivery information that we could provide that to the customer and kind of enhance their experience so the tying together of the restaurant technology team with the uh, web and app uh, technology teams to kind of create a holistic experience was a challenge. It wasn't something that you know was was often needed uh, previously, and so the, the mechanism wasn't in place to provide that. Brian, would you yeah. would you try to re re reload the slide that you're on right now? We're only oh. we're seeing it partially loaded. There you go. Thanks. Sorry about that. Let's let's blame Google. It's uh, it's Google Slides. Uh, okay, so big challenges require big effort uh, and and an alignment that may require uh, some specific management attention you know to achieve is not going to organically uh, appear. The next slide should be purple. Hopefully you can see it. Um, another lesson that I got from the outside world Brian, is Brian, sorry, try it try again. There you go. Okay. I'm just going to do it twice as a, as a rule from now on. Um, another big lesson was experimentation. The ability to experiment and try things out um, was really a key to um, finding out what was going to be successful quickly and then doubling down and doubling down on that you know, again. So in Secret Escape's case, that was um, a lot of A-B testing to see, you know, did improvements that we made in our you know, traditional core product if I changed the, the the flow a little bit, if I added you know a particular search functionality, did that improve our conversion rate or not? And the ability to kind of definitively measure the impact of these changes uh, was really uh, key to being able to understand. Okay, that's a that's a promising path that we should keep going down and invest more resources in. Um, previously, you know, um, at at Springer, we built an entire platform and we never experimented with anything. Every feature went from an idea to something that was live on the site, and you know, never, never got, never got reconsidered. You know, once it was, once it was put out there. Um, they also experimented by delivering products in a way that was costly at the beginning, just to see if they were worth doing. So, for example, the flight packages um, uh, at Secret Escapes, they really didn't make any money at all. Whenever someone uh, purchased a flight and hotel package, they really didn't make any money on the the flight portion of that because it was so costly to, to kind of implement. It boosted up the basket size uh, by, by a lot. So it increased the you know, top, line, top line revenue that, that Secret Escapes was, was collecting from its customers. Um, but it was so inefficient, you know, at least in the beginning, uh, that it really didn't, didn't add anything to the, to the profitability, but it allowed us to test out the proposition without having to go through all the effort of, of becoming an, ins an insured you know, uh, uh, travel operator. Uh, and then prove to us that okay, we should make that we should make that investment. Uh, same thing at, at uh, Just Eat. Um, we needed to experiment with which model was going to work best in different market. And as it turns out, it was a good thing we experimented with all of them because they were all, they were all used. Okay, now should be a green slide saying competition. The competition incentive, thanks. The competition incentive is really what drives the need for innovation. Um, one of the things that you know I quickly learned at, at Just Eat was they were very cautious about their external statements because they had gotten burned by a competitor um, uh, one-upping them or, or stealing some of their thunder by uh, releasing something before the, before Just Eat could because they found out about it you know before Just Eat could and so they 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 made the same thing and they delivered it you know sooner. Um, those kinds of we have to be really careful because uh, things that we do or that our customers do, uh, sorry, our competitors do, could really affect us, you know, in our bottom line. Was something that I really did not experience as much of uh, in the STM world. You know, the, maybe the longer sales cycles, or maybe the the fact that the products are you know inherently uh, non-substitutable uh, contributed to this. But it was really not the case that I ever saw a decision that was taken. At Springer, simply because you know of an, an action that Elsevier you know was was taking, uh, and same thing with at Just Eat, it was really the competition you know from Deliveroo uh, and and Uber Eats 
that put the uh, the, the core business's market share at stake that in that that cemented this. Okay, we really need to invest a significant amount of money and, and respond here. Okay, good blue slide. Um, another thing I learned was that existing revenue streams and legacy organizational structures are sometimes your biggest blockers. Sometimes the thing that makes it hardest for you to change is the fact that you're making money in a certain way from a certain group of people already. Uh, for example, at, at Secret Escapes, we couldn't change some stuff on the front end because we really didn't want to lose, you know, I think it was something like one and a half million in, in advertising, you know, revenue that we had from display advertising. But you know, we're talking about 1.5% of the total revenues and the, the opportunity you know, uh, on the, uh, if we were to grow the core business you know, was far greater than that, that potential loss. Uh, but sometimes you know, companies are held hostage by their existing you know, customers and their existing business model. Uh, same thing at, at, at Just Eat, um, the org structure there was something that they grew organically from when they were a very small company. And so at, at some point they had something like 35 development teams, but because everybody had originally been, been kind of grown up as a completely independent silo that had no um, uh, their own accountability directly, but no uh, interdependency with anybody else, accomplishing things that required multiple teams to work together um, was really, really challenging because uh, the org structure just didn't allow for it. Also, things like responding to change and being able to move people around. Uh, every time we wanted to kind of you know, move people around to, to satisfy the needs of a strategic initiative, that meant having a number of you know, conversations with every one of their, those teams as managers to say, I got to have this person from this team, this person from this team. The teams were not set up to allow for the flexibility for us to move resources around uh, in the most optimal way to, to be able to react quickly. And finally, Every company needs to become a data company. Every company that I've seen in the last five years was working on the same things, getting a data pipeline put in place, collecting all the data from dis disparate systems like finance systems, web systems, uh, production operations, you know, systems, CRM marketing, you know, systems, uh, and getting all those, you know, all that data together in one place so that they can actually do what it is they need to do better, whether that's forecasting their, you know, uh, perceived, you know, uh, demand or uh, managing their driver fleet, you know, better, or just understanding what article to recommend, you know, to someone visiting my, my uh, you know, content platform with millions of articles. Uh, every company really needed to develop uh, data competency as its own, you know, uh, internal department that was uh, uh, efficient and uh, competent enough to kind of deliver on business insight and BI, you know, for the organization. So those were my, those were my main takeaways. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for staying, staying this far to, uh, to listen to them. I would love if anybody had any questions about the way this relates to the, the scientific world or, or, or publishing, or if anybody has any other questions about the case studies. I did put two case studies together from Springer, from my Springer experience about open access and their involvement with open access and um, uh, ebook packages, you know, for how to make how to make books profitable. But I thought I'd, I'd take this opportunity to uh, take a break and, and see if there's any uh, questions or opportunity for discussion. All right, first, can we uh, thank Brian for his presentation? I'm not seeing any uh, comments or questions in the online uh, discussion forum or uh, the live Q&A. So do we have any from the floor here in London? I see Anthony <coughs> approaching a mic. Sorry, I get stiff from sitting down too long. Um, my question is this. I'm just, I agree with, I'm excited by what I've just heard. But in the end, in our business, I'm thinking here as a publisher, is, isn't it the thing that you need, that journals that publish the high, most high quality papers, and particularly ones which are novel, get the eyes of the researcher public, and they are seen as the ones they have to get hold of? Um, I would definitely agree 
that the entire STM publishing industry is kind of a uh, one dimension of value um, market. So I learned this the hard way when I was responsible for developing new products. And um, products that were not content based uh, or products that were you know, inherently tools for aiding research or had some value other than the, the content you know, uh, uh, of what you were reading, the, you know, the text and images of, were very difficult to sell. The customers were not predisposed to you know, purchasing them. They had very specific mandates you know, about what it was they were looking for. And everybody was looking for the same thing. Yes, it was quality. As to the question about um, the novelty of the of the content and what what relationship that has with with generating you know the uh, the, the the usage, um, I have to say, the only way that I ever experienced um, the usage of the content as you know determining the the, the commercial viability of, of the of the of the content was the the overall cost per download. Uh, calculation that 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 people would do. Yeah, I very rarely heard any salesperson or or any, got any feedback directly from a librarian about any individual you know journal or journal article or or product you know that they had purchased. It was always an aggregate discussion about the value of the aggregate you know package. Uh, that that one dimensional um, focus makes it challenging, shall we say, uh, to kind of uh, break out and, and try to offer anything differently. The, the best example that I saw of a company that said, okay, we're going to go beyond, you know, this, this particular dimension of value was that Elsevier uh, invested heavily in building a, a suite of uh, services that are really nothing to do with the, the content and really all to do about supporting the, the, the research workflow. At supporting the, the the task of the researchers at the institutions, or the the research of the, the institutions themselves, and acquiring you know new talent and, and and hiring people and understanding their research you know impact, and I think from my consulting uh, engagement at Elsevier, my understanding was that those services also required an entirely different sales approach. Uh, they they could not leverage much of their institutional librarian you know customer base. To make those products successful, so it required just as much sales effort, you know, to create a, a, the appropriate you know, organization to support those products as it did to create the products. So yeah, I'm, I'm, my my basic um, answer to you is yeah, I would agree. It's it's a it's a one uh, a one dimensional uh, marketplace. Before we go to Heather, we do have a we have a question from a remote uh, participant. Um, Brian, when you look at uh, publishing versus non-publishing companies, do you see a difference in attitude towards failure? <laughs> um, yes, but maybe not in the way that you would imagine. <laughs> I have to say, uh, companies that, that, that I've been in that haven't been in the STM space were definitely very experimental and tried lots of things. That does not mean that failure was more, more acceptable in any, in any way. Um, there was definitely a, a large pressure because of the competitive environment that the things that you spend your you know, limited development capacity on provide a return. And so there was very little stomach for things that, that um, were not immediate you know, successes or did not immediately prove out. There might have been, in some cases, things that we just didn't get right in the first iteration, but maybe with a, a couple of subsequent iterations, um, you know, we, we might have gotten there. We might have, you know, found out. But when you have a uh, a backlog of strategic of strategic plans, uh, where all of them say they're going to make ten million, you know, ten million dollars, uh, uh, then it's very difficult to argue for a round two, you know, of of some of these some of those things. So uh, definitely. The, the non-publishing companies that I worked in were very uh, willing to experiment, tried lots of different things. They had the, the tooling in place to measure the effectiveness of those experiments, but it doesn't mean that they really accepted failure. And uh, there were some things at Springer, you know, that we tried that, you know, didn't work. Uh, and I, I think they were treated as learning, learning experiences and, and nobody was really stigmatized, you know, for that. So uh, yes and no. All right, Heather. 
Um, hi, Brian. It's Heather Staines. I'm disappointed you're not here um, with us today because it would be great to see you again. Um, you touched upon some of the products that you worked on at Springer, and I was sitting here um, thinking that um, they were maybe a little bit ahead of their time and the audiences just weren't quite there to see the value. Um, and I'm thinking about Author Mapper, uh, and I don't remember what it was called, but when the when the articles were downloaded, the covers of the journals would kind of come into like a waterfall. And I think that kind of data visualization, we understand the value of that now, but back in 2009, 2010, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of like, oh, this is like a nifty party trick. But so could you talk a little bit about, you know, it sort of being the right time to have the audience uh, or the consumers kind of primed for the Hey, Heather, good, good, to, good to see you. I'm sorry I'm not there in person also. Um, I'm very happy that somebody found the gap, you know, that that author mapper, you know, was was, was uh, demonstrating existed um, by saying that there is a tool around helping researchers find other researchers. Uh, I believe it was uh, one of Elsevier's acquisitions that that uh, uh, was 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 doing that really well, uh, based on the the collected metadata, you know, that they had. Um, Heather. I first was launching ebook packages with Kluwer in 2001 and talk about being too early, too early for the market. Um, yeah, that was, that was not a, a great success. And then eight years later, um, it, you know, it saved the book program, you know, at, at Springer, if you, if you listen to, to Dare Kong's, you know, story, storyline about, uh, you know, they considered axing, you know, all book publication because it was just not very profitable until they found a business model that would allow for that. And I think the, the question about timing, the ebook packages concept was really enabled by other uh, adoptions of the big deal, um, you know, digital distribution, uh, the acceptance, you know, of a digitized product you know, in lieu of a, of, of a print product. It really could not, it could not have happened, um, I, you know, I think successfully uh, until those conditions, you know, had, had been met. So um, it definitely is something that I think strategically anybody thinking about new ventures, you know, if you really needs to take into account, which is what is the overall uh, set of, of circumstances necessary for this product to succeed? Uh, so for example, the self-publishing, you know, world of, of um, Ex Libris, you know, they were able to make ultimately, you know, almost 100,000 books, you know, so far, but they were never able to kind of break out to be more than a niche provider because the thing that was really needed in that marketplace was someone who could provide a, a, a wealth of services, including the, the, the content platform you know, to, to, to distribute the content to the customers, the, the, Kindle, the Kindle Unlimited. So I would, I would definitely you know, urge any, anyone looking at a, a new venture or in, in a, a large company looking at a, you know, uh, uh, another business line you know, to get into to try and, and understand what circumstances are going to be necessary for this product to really succeed. And maybe there's an opportunity there, right? Um, I definitely wouldn't try to make a search engine or uh, a, a retail online retail marketplace that was trying to, uh, you know, compete with Amazon. Uh, but there, there's definitely opportunity. For example, in the, the data space, we had a number of speakers today talk about, you know, the role that data is playing. I don't think there's a, a great uh, answer in the, in the data space uh, either, and that's definitely something that uh, is, is going to be, become. Only, only greater in importance as all research kind of becomes a question about what's the data behind it. Thanks, Heather. All right, and with that, we have to uh, end it. Uh, please join me in thanking Brian again for an excellent presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark to close the conference.